had been a member of two interconnected satanic groups for 30 months. She claims she both witnessed and suffered satanic ritual abuse. She told me how she got involved in Satanism. I was recruited in through a, a supposed church meeting by a boyfriend, which we were encouraged just to look into occultic ways of increasing our power and our desire to be wanted. Can you describe for us the kind of ritual abuse that you've seen? Children, small, under 10, sometimes from the outside, brought in, but mainly from the families, the active members. Uh, the children were usually drugged. They underwent full intercourse. They were forced into oral sex with children and with adults. There would be incantations, there would be sacrifice, there would um, they would come together in a meeting and actually um, go through prayers and rituals before the, the abuse. Um, specific lines were followed each time with the same sort of thing. You talked about incantations. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you meaning prayers? I suppose it would be prayers, yes. Who were they praying to? To Satan. Jennifer claims that she was made to take part in the sacrifice of young children, including one of her own. I was breastfeeding her. I was led into the room with her in my arms. My feet were tied so they couldn't actually move, but I was sat on sat down with her at my breast and she was taken off me and the high priest pierced her heart with a knife he then made me hold the knife with him holding my hand made me pierce her heart with a knife. She was... She was uh, laid out on an altar. And they used... objects and... The high priest then abused my child, sexually assaulted my child even though she was dead. And they cut flesh from her and used it as with the blood, with her blood, in a form of really opposite communion. They passed it round praying and eating the flesh and drinking the blood. Just one person's account. But what other evidence is there that Satanism exists in Britain today? Well, British satanic literature is readily available, from books to underground magazines. A material is being published today which openly advocates the practice of human sacrifice. Scottish occultist Alistair Crowley's masterwork, Magic in Theory and Practice, has a chapter devoted to the bloody sacrifice, in which he advocates the killing of... ...a male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence. Some modern satanic cults cite Crowley as an inspiration. Homage is paid to Crowley by, amongst others, the Temple of Set, an offshoot of the Church of Satan, and British-based Crowleyite groups such as the Temple of Psychic Youth.
But Satanism isn't illegal, and open satanic groups strenuously deny that abuse takes place. The police, too, have generally fought shy of confirming claims of ritual abuse. But now Dispatches has obtained a video produced by a group operating in Britain, which appears to show ritual abuse actually taking place. The video runs for nearly three hours. It begins with a stylized introduction to the group's philosophy. It then moves on to record the physical abuse of a young man. He's chained to a wall, whipped, and sprayed with what appears to be coagulant. He's then tied to a bed, injected, and in an apparently drugged state, is carefully and precisely cut with a large knife. Blood is then smeared over his body. The youth is urinated on and further physically assaulted. Many of the scenes are too horrific to show. The next sequence is in praise of the cult leader Jim Jones, who instigated the Jonestown massacre in Guyana in 1978, when more than 900 people committed suicide. Later, there are scenes of young children being buggered and sexual mutilation. One doctor describes the victim as a girl of 13 or 14. The video was handed to us by a professional carer looking after a young woman who claims to have been involved in the group that made it. The tape, which has been handed to the police, prompted Scotland Yard's obscene publications branch to set up a special unit to investigate ritual abuse. How would you describe this tape, what you've seen on this tape? Well, it contains scenes of um, offences of grievous bodily harm which are performed in a ritualistic fashion, in a ritualistic context. Will you, your unit, be investigating this? Yes, because, uh, as you know, uh, this thing will not go away and it's the duty of the police to actually try to establish the truth and I think that's our central role. Now, many people would say that the police haven't taken the concept of ritual abuse seriously in the past. Would you agree with that? No, I don't, I don't think I can agree that they haven't taken it seriously. Um, but what I will say is that uh, it's very difficult to investigate these types of allegations because of the way in which they're disclosed, um, either by children or by adult survivors. So, with the pictures before them, Scotland Yard now acknowledged the practice of ritual abuse at least in this case. But is it satanic? Jennifer claims to have been a member of the group that made this video. She says she took part in rituals held in the same room. Can you describe for us what's happening here, please? They're actually performing an abortion. Did you see this happen? Yes, I did. How many times did you see that happen? Um, I saw it twice, the set. Who is it that's performing the abortion? It's a pregnant woman. Is there a significance in that? Yes, the abortions were always performed by pregnant women. Um, so that the, because of the, the ritualistic value of it, um, of the passing of powers. What would happen to the fetuses? They'd be used in sacrifice and rituals. And what would happen to the remains? They'd be bent, um, parts of the bodies be melted, just bent down, rendered down, fats and things like that. Um, to be used in potions and salves that are used in rituals. We've seen something which looks rather like a dentist chair occurring a number of times in this tape. Have you seen this chair yourself? Yes, I have. And where was it? It was in a room in the east end of London, in the basement room. Is what we're looking at that room? Yes, it is. Are you certain? I'm positive. The room itself also appears to feature in occultic literature distributed by the video's makers. In the video are a number of indications that the rituals being carried out have a grounding in black magic or Satanism. 
A hell's head features a number of times, as does a death's head, ram's horns, and a severed goat's foot. One of the group's members is seen performing the ritual evocation of a demon. Blood, semen, and urine feature prominently. What appears to be blood is seen being drunk. A clock in the room is set to ten past three, representing the time of Christ's death on the cross, the moment of Satan's greatest power. What's known as an Asherah pole is also present. In biblical times, the symbol was used to worship the fertility goddess Ashtaroth, who required sexual license, self-mutilation, and in some instances, child sacrifice. But pride of place is given to the portrait of Alistair Crowley on the wall. The same picture features in a book on the life of Crowley, who practiced sex magic and blood rituals. Some of Crowley's followers were said to be branded. According to Jennifer, Crowley's disciples today are carrying on this practice. What is this? It's a branding iron used to brand people involved in the groups according to, in places according to their jobs within the group. Such as? Um, the recruitment would usually have it on their arm. Recruiters have it on their arm or under their arm pit. Um, some people would be branded within inside the vagina or in the inside of their legs. But, as we said at the beginning, this is beyond the imagination. In the words of one therapist, this is too terrible to hear. And because such material is so hard for us to face, it's altogether easier to turn away from it and deny it. Arguments have been put up to suggest this must be a myth, a moral panic put about by Bible bashers and others jumping on the bandwagon. One such skeptic, who's made a study of the subject, is Dr. Bill Thompson. It's a conflation of several sources, multivarious sources. One is fundamentalist Christians running on the belief of end time, that Christ's return is imminent so it would be God's time to reveal all the evil things that the devil is doing. Another is a certain group of Californian therapists that have had an incredible influence in England um, and are promoting their various brands and branches of therapy in England. They are the people who discovered multipersonality disorder they're trying to sell us this diagnosis for people we once would have designated as schizophrenic or whatever. And as a result of this, they're using the satanic ritual abuse panic to demonstrate that their theories are correct. There are individual social workers who, for one reason or another, believe that there are these certain kinds of abuses to explain some of the things they're coming across. Uh, you have cult cops coming over from America and telling us about some of the cases they've been dealing with, talking them up, and we've been buying that as well. And all these have slotted together in particular ways to produce the panic we have in England. But the myth is not simply being peddled by Christians. I've spoken to atheists and agnostics, professional people who are hearing the same things firsthand from their clients. They're not making money from it, and they didn't go looking for it at conferences. It found them. Here in London's Harley Street, therapist Vera Diamond, who makes it clear that she is not a Christian, has been treating an increasing number of people who claim to have been victims of ritual abuse. A member of the National Council of Psychotherapists, she's been practicing for over 20 years. She agreed to take part in a reconstruction of a therapy session with an actress based on tape recordings of a patient reliving hidden experiences that have been buried deep within the psyche, often for years. Everybody that I'm working with who claims to have been damaged in this particular satanic way is suffering from what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. And that means often being cut off from reality, being absolutely terrified for most of their life. We are talking about terrorism. We know that the brain unloads material and memories in a specific way. It starts with the kind of material that you can cope with, and it gets into the more difficult material to handle. So that there's a progression about the way they tell you things. And the interesting thing is that over the last 
five or six years, I'm hearing the same stories again and again, with slight variations, but the same things are happening, the same rituals, the same killings, the same shock, shock, shock to the system. Is there any way that any of this could be faked by your clients? I don't think you can fake, and I have checked with doctors, you can't fake going white, going absolutely icy cold. Um, seeing people's backs go into spasm. Seeing people relive ECT, for example, they jerk and they don't know what is happening to them. Very often when this material emerges in a relaxation technique, things occur and they do not recognize immediately what's happening to them. We make sense of it as the whole material comes out. For some survivors, no words can describe their trauma. So to release the pain, they paint how they feel. In these pictures, Juliet describes how she felt as she was abused by her parents. Her paintings are anguished and make uncomfortable viewing. Her answers have been voiced by an actress at her request to protect her identity. That's what it's like to be buggered when you're, you're really small. Um, that's what it feels like in, in your head. It's as if inside your head it explodes and the whole world's fallen to pieces and then it just drops down around your ears and this is something that you remember mm. this feeling mm. i always used to watch my dad's eyes because whatever his eyes looked like meant whether he was going to do something or not and it's like i'd always try and fill them with good things like if i could be good, like really good enough, he'd be happy and then he wouldn't do something. And it's like this little child is trapped in this big black eye. And that's, that's, it seems you just get stuck there. And how did he see you as a little child? Something, just something. I mean, it's not just something to be used and fucked whenever you want it, but, like, I mean, they've got... They're quite systematic in actually destroying the personality. That's what they try to do. So, same as he saw everything else, just something else to be destroyed, like something that has to be killed, destroyed. What is it that convinces you that this abuse was satanic? I've never questioned that it was satanic. I mean, we, we were from a long line of Satanists. With somebody that's never come across this sort of thing before, it's, it, it probably is too much to bear, and people will want to find other reasons. Mm -hmm. If somebody said to you, however gently, is there any way that you could have imagined this? What would you say to them? Um, um, I'd say to them that uh, they don't know the details that I've remembered because the details I've remembered I would never have imagined them in a million years I wouldn't have thought of them as possibilities for things for people to do but also even if I had I wouldn't have been so <sighs> while I've been doing my therapy I, ha I haven't been able to work or do anything. And if you're making up stories, you don't have to lie down on your bed for four years in between times, not being able to eat or sleep and being in physical pain and being terrified, terrified all the time. And away from Harley Street, NHS doctors are now beginning to take seriously the stories they're hearing from survivors. It's consistency and detail that's convincing even atheists like psychiatrist Victor Harris. A truthful testimony tends to be very detailed, not, not only just the details of the abuse itself, but mundane details, things like everyday conversations, uh, the design of the wallpaper, pictures on the wall, the type of carpets, the design on the candlesticks, all these sorts of things which make 
the whole picture convincing. And then there's details which I thought would not be known to a lay person, such as what happens to the cornea of the eye when caustic substances are applied. Um, the taste of blood, this sort of thing. There's an emotional response which is appropriate to the content of the disclosures. There's obvious fear, trembling, uh, palpitations. These sort of things couldn't easily be simulated. But at Nottingham University, Professor John Newson is concerned about the lack of hard evidence to back up such dramatic allegations. One of the problems is that there's very little proof to date of the more bizarre allegations which are frequently made, as, for instance, the sacrifice of children or fetuses, which are then supposedly disposed of, and sometimes the locations are given by children or by adults as to where these disposals took place, and having dug the area up and found absolutely nothing at all, um, it's not surprising if the police, for example, get a little sceptical after a while. Uh, that they've spent so much time on allegations where there was absolutely no evidence forthcoming. And I think one of the factors um, to bear in mind is if there are a group of people involved, a whole community of people involved in abusing children, or whole, some whole large group, it only requires one or two people to crack, as it were, under police investigation, to blow the stories uh, wide, as it were, and to pinpoint who was the perpetrator but very rarely does this seem to be happening and for that reason alone I, I think there are grounds to be skeptical about whether this is very widespread as is alleged. There is not one case in England where the children have spontaneously told these stories. In all the cases that I've looked at and that other people have looked at you'll find the following scenario. There is an allegation of possible abuse that proceeds in the normal way. The child will then uh, be picked up by one of the proselytizers, either one of the independent charitable care groups or a group of believing social workers or even policemen involved in a child protection unit. Over a series of weeks and more often months, they are telling different stories as they're interacting with these adults in what is often called by these adults therapy i.e. the adults have already assumed that the abuse has occurred in the way they believe it has and they are leading the children to tell those stories. Let's be quite clear about that. No child has ever made a spontaneous allegation. But how is a terrified and traumatized child supposed to produce a legally sound spontaneous disclosure? And it isn't just children, it's adults too. They're saying substantially the same thing from one end of the country to another, from one country to another. Children are telling the same stories. Children who are too young to read. Children who have no access to video nasties. Children who have no chance of communication with each other. No chances of collusion. Children as far apart as California, Canada, Holland, England. All coming up with the same stories. The same stories as have been told for hundreds of years and recorded as far back as 700 years ago. The coincidences are too great. And I think we must believe, I believe, that, satanic, that Satanism as such does exist. Satanic abuse, I think, exists. I don't think it's very common. I think it's rare. But I do think it is there. But what is common is the suggestion that horror movies could be to blame for these allegations. Some claim children's stories of ritual abuse could have been picked up from violent films hired by their parents. Children will describe the sense of touch, taste and smell around, for example, the consumption of um, feces, the drinking of blood and urine and semen, which could not be got from videos alone. And also the idea that it, it is uh, fantasy. I don't, it seems to me to go beyond the bounds of credibility to suggest that uh, because the children are describing such identical experiences that there's, there's some kind of collective fantasy going on. So I believe that what the children are recounting in the end are, are their memories.
not the product of fantasy or invention. And there's another problem for those who argue it's all in the mind. Sheila Youngson herself conducted a survey of carers dealing with ritual abuse survivors. 68% said they'd faced threats or intimidation. If those carers had any doubts, they're now convinced this is not fantasy. So where are the court cases? Where is the evidence? The Children's Society estimate that some 98,000 young people, many of them runaways, go missing each year, often in the anonymous centers of our big cities. Some never return. As for the bodies of so-called sacrificial victims, survivors say they've been dumped in acid, cremated, buried in existing graves, and even ground up. If these crimes are being committed, it's by people who make sure they leave no trace. The abusers know how the, the DNA system works, they know about how forensic science laboratories operate, and a lot of the abuse is in, is in a loving context. That there are no marks to, to find, there are no injuries usually. So it is a myth that we've got to try and get away from, that, that there is not always medical evidence there. And if there is, it is, it is open to, to conjecture. In Leeds, the authorities seem to have gone further than most in their willingness to take seriously the accounts they're hearing about satanic ritual abuse. At St. James Hospital, regular meetings are now held between therapists, psychiatrists, and even the police, who elsewhere have often distanced themselves from such allegations. The meetings have been set up to exchange information and to weigh the accounts that are being brought to carers. That as the year went on, as the two years went on, I th continually thought that I was hearing the worst things. I thought I'd heard the worst thing when the child said that um, that he was abused in the bath, and th that the worst thing was whenever the people who abused him dressed up in costumes like priests' costumes and ghosts' costumes. And yet, the worst thing for for the child was eating the feces and that we've got to understand it takes a lot of interviews done in a proper context and not to be accused of, of, of disclosure interviews and getting a child to actually say something, but to give the child time and space. And the judiciary and the, and the police and CPS have got to actually understand that. Because the, the inference is if the child doesn't tell straight away and then says something later on that in fact the child's lying, making it up, has been intimidated or coerced. And despite society's seeming unwillingness to countenance such allegations, the police here believe they're on to something. In the 80s, there were concerns about child sexual abuse, and professionals working in the field actually had the support of society. But as we've become more experienced and, and talking to children, and, and in, certainly in our force, we've got eight specialist child abuse units who spend a lot of time talking to children. And I think for the first time, we've been able to listen to children talk to us about child sexual abuse. And we are now learning about this further extension of child sexual abuse and the ritualistic elements to it, which do seem fairly bizarre to people who, who have probably never heard a child discuss child, child abuse. I think what our experience has shown us that it, something like that does exist, whatever you're going to call it. Uh, but we have experience of children and adults talking about very, very bizarre, unusual practices that have these ritualistic elements, the repetitiveness, the symbolism, and that children particularly uh, are talking about that now more and more. There is some danger of a kind of mass hysteria here that can occur when too many people start believing something uh, which might have had some grain of truth in it somewhere but has become over-elaborated and worried about beyond reason. Um, we still don't know the outcome of a number of cases uh, in this country. Uh, the Rochdale case has been dismissed. Uh, the Woodford case uh, fell apart because the children's evidence was clearly inadequate. Um, there's the Orkney case. We don't know the outcome of that yet. It's still being endlessly debated. And we don't know whether there was, in fact, uh, any serious group abuse of children going on. Um, but on the whole, the verdicts coming out from uh, legal sources seem to be not guilty or not proven. But in fact, there have been convictions where Satanism has been implicated in the abuse. 
Retired Detective Chief Superintendent David Cole was the officer in charge of the Smith and Hickman case, where young girls were abused by four adults. The leader of the group, Malcolm Smith, claimed to possess satanic powers. Yes, that was satanic abuse, because quite clearly uh, rituals were involved to induce uh, a pattern of behaviour in, in the children and to induce fear into the children not as I believe is more generally the case, where it is used as an excuse to induce fear into children. So you think that the people involved believed, or he certainly believed? He certainly believed yet that he had the power of Lucifer. Do you believe from your experience then that satanic abuse, ritual abuse, actually exists? Well, I must say that based upon the experience of two cases over 34 years connected with the police service um, and that experience must indicate to me that it does exist yes um, but how widespread it is then I wouldn't be prepared to comment because you know one bucket of sand doesn't make a desert psychiatrists offer another reason for the lack of prosecutions survivors can be so traumatized the conscious memory of their abuse is wiped clean it can take up to 20 years for those memories to resurface. And by that time, the trail is stone cold, as Sue Hutchinson found. One of the reasons was that the abuse happened over 16 years ago, so it's very hard for them not just to find evidence, but put a case together over that length of time. And that is going to be the same for most adult survivors. And secondly, because my abusers were in their late 70s, and that went against us. So there was too big a gap between the abuse and your disclosure of it? Yes. I think a lot of that was not just because it was very difficult, perhaps, for us to talk about it, because there was nobody to listen to us. The police investigate all cases very thoroughly. But there are two elements to a case. There is the sexual abuse element and then there is the ritual element. Now where the sexual abuse can be substantiated medically, there may be no substantiation for the um, ritual element. It is important that the credibility of the victim be maintained and unfortunately if a, a victim starts off with a story which is totally credible and can, can up to a point be proved and then goes on to an un unsubstantiated, incredible story, then the whole case is likely to fold. In Britain, few cases go beyond the civil courts. There's no crime of ritual abuse. But in America, ritual abuse is being outlawed in a growing number of states to try to crack down on offenders. Here, we seem to prefer to shout down those who suggest this may be happening. Court cases have been dropped because it was felt jurors would never believe the evidence. In others, details of rituals have been deliberately suppressed. In Britain, those who claim to be survivors must add fear of ridicule to their terror of coming forward. But they say the biggest barrier is the guilt that's been forced upon them by their abusers. Guilt over being made to take part in the abuse of others. It's like this one is about, it's called collaborator, and it's about how you're implicated in every way, like sexually implicated from day one, and you're made to kill things and kill animals and kill people. Um, so you just walk around feeling like that. You think that's what you are because that's how they make you feel, because that's what they are. It says here, at the bottom, found at the scene of the crime. Yeah. And it says found guilty. Yeah. But they did it to you. Yeah, but that's how they make the child feel, on purpose. It, um, um, systematically, they go all out to make you feel that you're that and that you can never get away from them 
and so you'll grow up like them. Have you thought about going to the police about this? Yes, I have. I decided that it was more likely to be me and my family that suffered than anyone else. There was just no way that it would get any further. Why? Because there's too many people who are in top-ranking jobs that can stop it. What do you think would happen to you if you did go to the police? I would be made out either to be absolutely crazy or that I would lose my children. Um, it's been put that I'd probably be used as a scapegoat as an excuse to, to ridicule it. What would it take now for adult survivors to come forward to the police? I think it takes uh, the fact that, that they have to know they're going to be believed. They also already are doing this. I think it's now the time for all therapists or police or whoever dealing with these survivors to say, yes, we have had cases. That will make more survivors not just have the strength to come forward, but know that they're going to be listened to. Is there any way you could kind of give an amnesty or something like that to, to people who want to come forward? Well, the police can't actually do that um, without, without consent of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, but of course there are ways in which we're looking to try and overcome that problem. To actually hear a child talking about smearing faeces all over the wall uh, and, and killing animals and, and all sorts of things that we do here in the course of our work is strangely worrying and concerning and a lot of people will probably think it's easier to ignore it and dismiss it as, as a fantasy or children lying or watching videos or, or whatever the, the excuse is around. But I think that we, certainly in our force, I think we have a duty to listen to children as long as we remain objective and impartial and deal with it in a proper level-headed manner and, and just be able to listen. It may be wrong to suggest this is widespread, but how can we continue to see no evil and hear no evil when the prima facie evidence is before our eyes. Until society turns to face and examine such material, however painful that might be, we cannot begin to help those who claim to be its victims.